Good evening, everyone. How are you all? All right, huh? Praise God. It's good to see you all again. It's good to be with you all again. We've been talking about health, huh? Have you learned something so far? There are some people who are in the valley of decision. Because our theme is Choose Life Today. And I believe there are a few here and maybe watching on the live stream where they are in the valley of decision, whether it's with the diet or whether it's a spiritual reform. And the amazing thing is that whenever we make a decision, the most important part about making the decision should always be our motive, the reason for making the decision. I am a vegetarian, but I think that word has been abused a lot, so I like to say plant-based whole foods, meaning I eat plants and I only eat the foods that have not been refined, where we have changed them too much and removed the value. Why am I a vegetarian? Why do I eat the way I do? What's my motive for trying to be healthy? Initially, when I didn't have the right motive, I struggled and I kept lapsing back to the old diet. But when I had the right motive, I haven't turned back since. And my motive may be different from yours, but my motive is that I have given those things that are not really bad anyway. Meat, all the pleasurable foods. I gave up chocolate and all the sweet biscuits and things. All the cakes of this world, all the ice creams. Why did I give them up? I placed it on the altar of sacrifice for my Lord and Savior. That's my personal decision. I would rather serve Him in health than take those things. So it's my own decision with the Lord. And my reason has kept me going. In spite of what people say, oh, you're missing out on something, oh, you need to get fatter, oh, you need to do this. It's kept me going. So whatever reason you make, the motive is the most important. Whatever decision you make, the motive is the most important thing. Let me lighten it up a bit, since you're all looking serious at me. Why do you wear a seatbelt? Many of us in Papua New Guinea, we wear a seatbelt because we don't want to be arrested by the police or charged by them. Is that true? It's not for safety. But what should be the real motive? Safety. It should be for safety, not because we're going to be charged or arrested. That's the wrong motive. Once I saw a patient that and this patient of mine had issues. She told me about her issues. Husband was a Christian. And she told me, my husband's having an affair. Seen another woman. But I'm only staying in the relationship because of the kids. I don't want to spoil the kids. So I asked her, why did you marry him? And she said, because I loved him. I said, so why should you stay with him? Is it because of the kids? You didn't marry him because of the kids. Does anyone ever marry someone because of the kids? Can I see your hands? Or just raise it in your minds. <laughs> no one marries someone because of the kids. Am true, huh? We marry someone because we love them. So I told her the reason you should stay with your husband is because you love him. And they're still together today and we praise God. We praise God for that. The motive is the most important thing. So whether you make a decision tonight, don't make it out of emotion. Don't make it because you're scared you're going to get a disease. Don't make it out of fear. That's the wrong reason to change. Don't run to the Lord because you're scared of judgment. But run to the Lord, change your diet because you love the Lord. And that's always the right reason for change. You'll never go back. Let me also mention this. It's important. I need to mention this one. 
change or these decisions we make are intellectual decisions. Meaning we use our what? Our minds are intelligence. We don't use our emotion. We don't use our emotion. We use our minds, our intelligence. And that's what Jesus said. If you want to follow me, do what? If you want to follow me and be my disciple, what must you do? Yes, carry your cross, but he said it somewhere else too. If any man wants to follow me, they must do what? Any accountants here? This is your favorite activity. You must count the what? Count the cost. If any man is going to sit and build a house, look at how much it's going to cost him. If you're going to go to war, look at how many soldiers you need. If you're going to follow the Lord, if you're going to make a decision to change your diet, count the cost. If you're going to change your diet, understand that you're not eating those meat products again. Understand that you're not touching those sweet things again. You, you know the cost. It's an intelligent decision. If you're following the Lord, understand that you're giving up the things of the world. You know the cost. Count the cost, my brothers and sisters. If we have to make a decision, please, my brothers and sisters, I pray with you that you make it for the right motive, right reason, out of love and count the cost. You will never turn back. Let us pray together. Our gracious Father, our loving God and King, please, Lord, may you bless and be with us tonight. Bless your word through the health message and bless your people and lift them up to the standard of Jesus Christ, just as you may lift me up too. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything and we ask you, Lord, this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Choose life today, our theme, huh? And here is our topic for tonight. Are we addicted to drugs? What are drugs? Can I ask? What are drugs? You are all whispering tonight. The elephants can hear the low sounds, but I cannot. So we'll try and look at drugs. Traditionally, people think of drugs as all the bad things. Same true or no God? That's correct, huh? You think of all the bad things. You think of marijuana, you think of um, tobacco, you think of alcohol, you think of cocaine, heroin, all those drugs. And amazingly, we have some of those advanced drugs in Papua New Guinea already. They're coming through our country. So we have those drugs. But are those the only things that we call drugs? Tonight we'll try and see if we ourselves are addicted to drugs in one way or another. Are we addicted to drugs? What's your personal answer? Most people are saying yes, so it's good. Maybe you have insight already. Kids, what is this thing? Train. What kind of train? Maybe the adults can help you with that. What kind of train? Steam train. Can you see the steam coming out of it? They burn a fire and it powers the engine. So that's a steam train. And those trains, they, they don't exist anymore. Only if you want to go and pay some money, they'll let you go on it to see. But those trains, they don't use them anymore. We use powered trains now. But these were the trains that helped to connect America and Europe before, the steam trains. And they needed to run on these kind of tracks. The thing about trains is they don't climb big mountains. So you either, if you come to a mountain, you either have to blow the mountain up or run around it. So that's the thing with trains. The road must be more or less flat. And that's the reason why we can't have trains in Papua New Guinea. If you ever try and go for a pathfinder hike, you'll be going up and down, up and down, and you're wondering when you're going to get to the destination. They just say it's over there, close to Mipla come up. We're almost there, and then you're still going. It's a prophecy that never fulfills. So for the train tracks, you need to make sure the place is flat. We can't have it here. This fellow's name is Phineas Gage. Does anyone know Phineas Gage? Phineas Gage lived in the 18, 18th century or 1800s. And in 1848, he was 25 years old. And he worked with a rail, railroad building company. They built the place where the trains can run on, the tracks for the trains to run on. And Phineas was a very smart man, very intelligent, very kind, well-mannered. He spoke nicely to people. He was quite smart. 
And he was not someone who went and drank around the place or caused trouble. He was a very nice man, never swore, almost like a Christian, very nice. I'm sure he was religious to some point. And people loved Phineas so much that in his work, they promoted him at the age of 25 to be a foreman. He looked after the others in making the train track. And you see this iron bar he's holding. That iron bar helps him to dig into those mountains we were talking about so they can place dynamite in it. And he puts the dynamite, packs it into that hole and then pulls the wire out and then they light it and it blows up the mountain. So that's Phineas's job. And one day they came to this mountain in America in 1848. They came to this mountain and it was Phineas's job to dig the hole in the mountain. So he went and made the small hole and started packing the dynamite. But as he was packing the dynamite in, his steel rod, his steel rod which weighs about 7 kilograms, as he was packing the dynamite in, he hit a stone and it sparked. What do you think happened? There was an explosion. And the rod he was holding was flung with great power that it came in through his left cheek and came out the top of his head and it flew some distance and landed there and he flew some distance and landed away from the rod. And if you see this wax museum figure they have of him, They've put the rod in his head. But the rod actually went through and came out. This is just to dramatize it more and they put it like that. They put the rod stuck in his head, but it actually went through the left cheekbone, popped out the left eye, and went through the left part of the front brain, and then came out through the skull, breaking the bones. And this is, an, this is what they think the bone showed, based on his actual skull which they dug up. So that's how the rod went through. Just under the left cheekbone, went through the brain, then popped out the skull and separated the skull too as it was coming out. And he lost chunks of his brain with the skull. Now you imagine, Phineas was alive at the time when they didn't have any painkillers. If they wanted to break, uh, fix your broken bone, they have to give you alcohol to drink so you will go off a bit and then they can put your bone in place unless you want to feel the pain. There was no painkillers like Panadol or Pethidine, Morphine, whatever we have today, those wonderful painkillers, nothing. No antibiotics, no Amoxicillin, which some people like to buy from the market and anywhere. No wonderful antibiotics, nothing. So when he had this injury, he was sick for almost two months. He amazingly, and the amazing thing, people thought he was going to die. The amazing thing is that he survived. Phineas survived. And he actually lived for another 13 years after the accident, and he didn't die from the cause of the accident. This is Phineas after the accident. If you look at his left eye, it's closed permanently. Because the left eye was popped out by that rod. Phineas was allowed by his company to return to work. He was allowed by the company to return to work, but they noticed something about Phineas. This very nice young man who was very kind, very smart, very responsible, very respectful. His attitude changed. Now Phineas couldn't sit the same in one place anymore. He got up quickly, started moving around. He got angry, restless. He started fighting with people. He started calling people names. Phineas started getting drunk, spending his money on gambling. Phineas started running around with women all over the town. And then they, they saw this fellow, they said, this is not Phineas. So what happened to Phineas actually has become quite useful for us doctors. Now we understand what happened to Phineas and we understand the importance of the front part of the brain. You see, when Phineas was injured, this front, front part of the brain called the frontal lobe was damaged. The left side was hit out, but when he had the infection, it also damaged the right side. And now we understand that the front part of the brain is responsible for how we interact with people. Like when you go to Morocco, you see some people peeing on the fence in broad daylight in front of everyone else. Their frontal lobe is not working. I sometimes feel like screaming at them. You know, a righteous scream, huh? And if you had a, if you had a boxing glove that connects to the car, like in the cartoons, you give a righteous punch too. Just to wake them up and do, do the right thing. Their frontal lobes are not working. The, how you interact with people, it's in your front part of your brain. 
How you go and do, you know, mannerisms, ah, excuse me, thank you, sorry, I'm sorry. All these things are in the front part of the brain. Your ability to calculate. One plus one, two plus two is in the front part of your brain. Your ability to see how much money you need for your bus fare. When you're going to buy your lunch, okay, I'm going to use this much, I'll have this much left, I'll use that for bus fare. That one is in the front part of the brain. And you are concerned about how you look after yourself. That's in the front part of your brain. And believe it or not, also your judgment, the difference between wrong and right is in the front part of your brain. And more importantly, more importantly, you and I, our character and our personality is in the front part of our brain. The frontal lobe contains our character. The frontal lobe contains our character. Let me ask a question. What does God want to change in us? What does God want to change in us? What does God want to change in us? Does He want to change our hairstyle? Does He want to change the way we dress? What does God want to change in us? Our what? Our character. And where is our character? Scientifically, where is our character? In the front part of our brain. So where do you think God is going to be communicating with us? Your intelligence, everything is in the front part of your brain. When you make a decision, you're making it using the front part of your brain, your frontal lobe. When you and I feel emotions, which are something different, they come from the other side of the brain, not the front part. Slightly lower and to the back, not from the front part. So the front part of the brain is where God wants to communicate with us. What's our topic tonight? Are we addicted to what? Drugs. So what are drugs? Believe it or not, drugs are anything that affects the frontal lobe and causes addiction. We're going to use that definition and we're going to look at some drugs. Anything that affects the frontal lobe and causes addiction. Can you say that with me? Or is it too hard? Anything that affects the frontal lobe and causes addiction. Anything that affects the frontal lobe and causes addiction. Do you think you can remember that? Okay, good. So that's the definition for drugs. Now let's go through some drugs and we'll see. But before we go through, we need to explain that word addiction. Because that's the thing that defines a drug. It makes you addicted to it and it holds you in prison. Believe it or not, addiction traps you. All your money you start giving to that thing that you are addicted to. All your time you start giving to that thing you are addicted to. All your attention, your effort, you start giving to the thing you are addicted to. Take for example someone who is addicted to marijuana. If you gave them money, what would they do? They would go and do what? Buy marijuana. Even though they are hungry, they would go and buy marijuana. And that drives them down even further because they are entrapped by this addiction. They are imprisoned by this addiction. They are powerless. So in, a, in order to understand addiction better, let me use the most common drug in the world. What is the most common drug in the world? The most common drug in the world is sugar. Kids, did you hear that one? The most common drug in the world is what? Sugar. Sugar. Mm. You guys look like little druggies. <laughs> I'm joking. You know, uncle is joking. Uncle loves you very much. Sugar is the most common drug. And let me explain why. We're going to look at two features of addiction. Two features of addiction. When you take your tea, let's say, for example, you drink lemongrass tea, and you tell your wife, please put two tablespoons of sugar. And she puts two ta tablespoons of sugar, brings it to you, and says, oh, you nice plan, Mary Strat, me thank him, God Strat, or me marry you. I thank God that I married you, because you're so nice. You make my tea very nice. And you drink that tea. After three months, your wife brings your tea, and you're like, hey, 
What's wrong with you? Didn't we have enough money and why didn't you buy any sugar? Why are you saying that? No, because the tea has no sugar. Hey, I put two teaspoons of sugar. No, no, no. Come, put one more. Yes, I can't taste anything. And then you drink it and say, this tastes nice now. And after six months, hey, you, you didn't put any sugar again. What's wrong with you? No, there are three teaspoons of sugar inside. No, no, no. Bring the sugar again. Four teaspoons of sugar. Do you know what that's called? That's called tolerance. And that's the first feature of addiction. You start to tolerate the pleasure that that drug gives you and you need more to give you the same pleasure. Am I right? Huh? You see people who drink alcohol, they take one bottle of beer and maybe they'll get drunk now. As they keep drinking, that one bottle of beer may not make them drunk the same as it did the first time. They'll need three bottles to get the same effect. As they keep progressing in their, their career of drinking, then they might need six bottles to give them the same effect from the three before. That's tolerance. You need more to give you the same pleasure as time passes. Now, is it easy to leave sugar when you've been drinking your tea with sugar for so long? Is it easy to let go of that four teaspoons of sugar in your lemongrass tea? Will that husband complain if the wife just gave him plain lemongrass? Yes, sir. Why? Because he has become dependent upon it. He has become dependent upon it. He cannot live without the sugar, and that's what we call dependence. That's the second feature of addiction. The two features of addiction, number one, you by needing more, you need more to give you the same pleasure, and then you can't let go of it. Is that okay? I want you to remember that. Is that too much for you? Did I just overfeed you there? No, okay, please, good. Hold it in your mind. When kids take sugary foods, when they see a chocolate bar, you buy it in the store, believe it or not, as soon as they eat it, it releases chemicals in their brains that make them feel good. And it's because of these chemicals, they don't ever want to let the chocolate bar go. And that's the reason when you go into shopping centers, where do they place the chocolate bars? Do they place it at the back? They place it where the checkout counter is so that your kids will come and pick it up and put it on the counter. No one ever places the dog food on the checkout counter. That's why our dogs are hungry most of the time. Everyone forgets the dog food. But they go, they place the chocolates there. So everyone picks the chocolates. And it affects the brain. It releases chemicals that take away pain. It releases chemicals that make them feel good. So as soon as you don't give them the chocolate, what do they do? You don't want to buy it for them. What do they do? Kids, what do you do to your mummies and daddies if they don't want to buy it for you? Cry, yeah. And then because you'll say, hey, they might see that we're not a Christian family. This child is crying like this. Give it quickly. <laughs> so you have to quieten them down. So it affects the brain. What did we say is the definition of drugs? Anything that affects the Frontal lobe end causes what? Addiction. So different substances can become drugs. And some of them will look at it and will go through. We looked at one already. This is another one, huh? What's that? Cigarette, huh? Made from tobacco. Do you know how many chemicals are present inside a cigarette? When you... The, the governments allow about four to five hundred chemicals to be placed in a cigarette when they're making it. Four to five hundred chemicals. And when you light it up, it produces seven thousand chemicals. So you inhale seven thousand chemicals into your lungs. And out of those seven thousand chemicals, seventy of them, seven zero, are cancer causing substances. Have you guys heard of? Heard of some places where there has been radiation leak, like in Japan and in some parts of Russia, where the nuclear power plant, it exploded and radiation was leaked out. Have you heard of that? Not the kids, but maybe the adults, huh? If you go and live in those countries, your chance of getting cancer is higher, especially those cities where the problems happened. So when you go to those countries, and you live in those cities, your chance of getting cancer is higher. The people who live there, they have more cancers. 
When they looked at it, the chance of you getting cancer if you go into outer space is even higher. Because there's, there's no atmosphere protecting you from the radiation of the sun. But then, believe it or not, one thing has more radiation than the sun. One thing has more radiation than the unprotected human body in outer space. One thing has more radiation. Can you guess what that one thing is? That one thing, believe it or not, is cigarette smoking. It produces more radiation to the body than any of those things. But people don't know and they love the smoke. Look at some of the things inside. Look at some of the things inside cigarette smokes. They have nicotine which kills insects. This is the chemical that addicts you. They have ammonia which is a toilet cleaner. They have some compounds that they put in paint in there. Methanol they use for rocket fuel inside. Arsenic which they use to kill people is also put in cigarette smokes. What is this, kids? A picture of what? The lungs. What color are our lungs? Yeah, red or pink, huh? That's when they're healthy and nice. What is this? What do you guys think this is? Seaweed? It looks like seaweed, but it's not seaweed. It's actually the lining of our airways. The lining of our airways has little hairs on it so that when you have dirt in your lungs, the coos catches it and then this little seaweed-like things waves it up to the top and you can cough it out. But people who smoke, these seaweed-like things which are here, they actually get destroyed. This is when there's plenty of them. They've just colored it. It's not blue like that inside, but they've just colored it. So if you look at the first square on your left, that's a normal, normal amount on the top. And then as you go, those are people who are smoking a lot. And people who smoke a lot, you see the one at the bottom on the right. Can you see any little seaweed-like things there? They are all gone. So that's why when people smoke, sometimes you hear when they cough, <coughs> you hear this nice, really wet cough coming. And that's why people say cancer box. Because of that wetness of the cough, it just basically means they're not removing the mucus from the chest anymore. They've destroyed their lungs. And that's the number three leading cause of death in the world. Chronic obstructive airways disease. Chronic obstructive airway disease is the number three leading cause of death in the world. Number three leading cause of death in the world. And that's from smoking. From smoking. And believe it or not, if you get the road, what do we seal the road with? Tar. If you smoke for two years, you have two cups full of tar in your lungs. That's enough to seal two square meters of road with two years worth of smoking. And this is how the normal lungs look. See what the lungs of a smoker looks like. Which one do you prefer? The healthy one, yeah. Now, what part of your brain does smoking affect again? What did we say? The frontal lobe. And what's the definition of a drug again? Anything that cause, affects the frontal lobe and causes what? Addiction. And where does God want to communicate with? Frontal lobe. Now, this is another problem with smoking. It causes cancer. Sorry, images there. Breast cancer, cancer, test, and also cancer of the cervix, test. What is this one? Marijuana. And people love to smoke marijuana. Actually, believe it or not, marijuana use is increasing in the world. Even in some countries in the world that are supposed to be developed, they are allowing marijuana to be smoked in the public. Good. When you're connected to the mother, you always survive. All of us have our connection cut off, but now we're reconnected tonight.
So even in some developed countries like Canada and in parts of America, they have marijuana legalized now. My cousin who lives in Canada says that when she walks to work, it's, it, she feels like she's smoking marijuana all the way to work because she smells marijuana all the way. People just smoke it freely now. And the bad thing about marijuana is that the most, the most likely people to take marijuana are teenagers, young people. And marijuana actually affects the frontal lobe and it destroys the communication that the frontal lobe is trying to build up between all those different brain cells. So as a result, you see a lot of young people losing their minds. And they are never the same again after they've taken marijuana. It's very sad. Marijuana is extremely dangerous. It's not good in any kind of way. A poison is a poison regardless of whatever it is. A poison is still a poison. If you take enough of it, it will destroy you. And marijuana actually gives more tar into your lungs than tobacco. So your lungs build up with tar faster than tobacco. What's this one? Betel nut. That's the favorite in PNG. Yeah. If you try and take this away, if you try and ban it, people will fight. But this thing we love so much and we smile about and people wonder if, you know, we've killed people and there's blood lying on the floor everywhere and the teeth are black like watermelon seeds. This thing actually leads to mouth cancer. My apologies for another strong image there. It causes mouth cancer. And believe it or not, mouth cancer is not a nice illness to have this one, this person actually died from it. Because as it grows, it will rot in your mouth and the fluids that come from it will go back into your throat again. So you are eating and smelling decaying tissue every single day. When a person with mouth cancer this size walks into the ward, we can smell them a, a long way away. And we know they are coming in. And if we have to operate on this person, we'll remove their jawbone, we'll remove most of their face, and then get the chest muscle and try and bring it back to build up the face again. So it's not a good thing at all. And after that complex surgery, they still die after six months to one year. What part of the brain does the bitul not affect again? The frontal lobe. What's this one? Coffee. What's the drug inside coffee? Caffeine. And this is what it looks like when they take it out of the coffee beans a white crystalline powder. And then they put it into a lot of things. This is one of them. Do you know how much coffee is in, co in a, a can of Coca-Cola? Believe it or not, there's one cup of strong coffee inside a can of Coca-Cola. And it makes you addicted, you can't let go of it. One cup of strong coffee inside a can of Coca-Cola. Some of you like that drink, huh? Yes. Do you know how many cups of coffee are inside a can of boo? This energy drink. It actually has two cups of coffee in the bigger size. Two cups of strong coffee. This is actually very dangerous. If you get up to about seven cups of strong coffee and you drink it within four hours, you can kill yourself. The caffeine can kill you, no matter how healthy you are. So a lot of young, a good number as there are cases of young people who have died from drink, drinking energy drinks in foreign countries. Would you give coffee to a young child? But we're giving all those drinks. So we have to look at what we're giving to our children. Does Mountain Dew contain coffee? It contains one cup of coffee. That's why if you drink this drink, you will want to go back to it. Because it has something to addict you. Not just the sugar. Red Bull and Monster, they have one and a half cups of coffee inside. What does caffeine do to your body? This is the human body. And if you look at this picture, those organs you see in the abdomen that are showing there, they are actually the kidneys. But if you look above the kidneys, there's another organ there. We call it the adrenal gland. I've highlighted it orange. The adrenal glands are very important for our body, even though we don't take notice of them. Most, who's heard of the adrenal glands before? 
Not many people are, just a few, maybe the science people. But they are very important, they help us to live. Now when the sun is up, and you need to exercise, run away from someone, or you need to fight with someone, or you need to work or go to school, your adrenal gland releases a lot of chemicals. And those chemicals help your heart to work faster, work stronger, so you can pump more blood around your body. And at the same time, it makes your brain to think better. So it releases all those chemicals. They come from the adrenal gland. But when the moon comes out, when it's night, the sun goes away and the moon comes out, everything is supposed to be resting. Your adrenal gland doesn't stimulate your heart anymore, it doesn't stimulate your mind anymore, it stops. But when you and I drink a cup of coffee, it makes your adrenal gland to work, your adrenal gland makes your heart to work, and it makes your brain to work. And the effect lasts for 12 hours. So if you drink this cup of coffee at 6 in the night, it will wear off at 6 in the morning, the next day. 12 whole hours, your brain and your heart have been stimulated. And that's why people who drink a lot of coffee, they end up with this problem called stress or anxiety. Stress and anxiety is not good. What's this one? SP. South Pacific beer. Is beer good for you? Someone once told me that drinking beer in moderation is good for you. You don't know what you're missing. If you drink one bottle of beer, you will lose your shame. You won't have any shame anymore. You will lose your inhibition. So if you're a boy that you used to be shy to talk to the girls, you'll walk up to this girl and tell her, my sister, did anyone ever... T well, you won't call her my sister, obviously. <laughs> you'll call her her name and tell her, did you ever know that you are the most beautiful girl in PAU? Even the lilies in the pond do not compare to you. When the ducks, they fly and they come to gracefully land, even you, the way you walk is more graceful than that. <laughs> if I was the stone in the grounds, I would catch your feet. <laughs> That's what happens when you take one bottle of beer. You lose all your inhibition. The person who is ashamed becomes the most courageous person in the world. When you take four bottles of beer, believe it or not, you actually start to lose your skills at coordinating yourself. So you can't coordinate properly anymore. Driving becomes dangerous. Because when we are driving, we are doing a number of things. We are doing the steering wheel, checking the gear, on the brakes. Many things are going on at the same time. And we are looking at the road, checking for people coming on the sides. And this becomes dangerous when you take at least two bottles of alcohol. You're already legally drunk by the time people take two bottles of alcohol. It's not safe. Four bottles, you lose your motor skills and coordination. And when you go to ten bottles, you start to talk like a baby. You go backwards. You start to talk like a baby, and you lose all those skills, and at the same time, you lose the difference between right and wrong. That's why the people who commit the most trauma, the most harm to people, are people who are drunk. A lot of the people that get admitted to the emergency are either drunk people or people who have been hurt by drunk people in violent acts. So alcohol is very bad. And believe it or not, now, now doctors overseas are now telling women, any amount of alcohol is not good for you and your baby. Before they used to say, drink in moderation, one glass a day, once in a while is okay. Now they find that if a woman takes any amount of alcohol any time in pregnancy, the baby can be poisoned. And your baby will not be the same quality as when you developed it. And by Bagara. Any amount of alcohol is toxic to baby. And this one is just down the road, next to the cemetery. It's probably near the right place. They're manufacturing it near the right place. You drink that, you just go into the cemetery next door. It contains almost 50% alcohol. Normal beer contains 4.5% alcohol. That's why people who drink this kind of hard stuffs, they go crazy more quickly. And alcohol damages this important organ we call the liver. The liver is so important for so many things. It helps our body to make use of the food that we take in through our intestines. And it 
removes all the poisons from our systems to very important organ. But people who take alcohol, their liver starts to look like the one on the right. Can you see that? Would you like your liver to look like that? And they die. They actually die. And it's not a good way to die when your liver fails. Your body becomes drowned with its own fluids. You drown in your own fluids. And another thing that alcohol causes is what? Domestic violence. One in three women in Papua New Guinea are abused. And alcohol is one of the main reasons abuse is happening. What part of the brain does alcohol affect? The frontal lobe. And where does God want to communicate with us? Which part of the brain? Frontal lobe, where our character is. He wants to change us. But does alcohol allow that to happen? No. You cannot go and preach to a drunk person. One of our friends, we used to be involved with the ministry. He used to smoke marijuana. And when he's under the influence of marijuana, he used to try and preach to his marijuana friends, the friends who are taking it with him. It's not going to work. Science proves it. You can't do anything. The brain is affected. What's the definition of drugs again? I want to see the last time. Can you remember? Anything that affects the frontal lobe and causes what? Addiction. Good. Now we're going to look at some other drugs and I'm going to ask you if they are drugs. Is this one a drug? When you start on Facebook, you say, I'm only going to spend 10 minutes. After a while, 20 minutes. After two months, one hour. After a while, you're sleeping at 12 minutes. Toot, 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 toot. You're checking it again. That's called tolerance. And is it easy to delete your Facebook account? No. Dependence. Addiction. Facebook has a lot of good. It's showing the programs tonight. But believe it or not, many people, myself included at one point in time, couldn't handle Facebook. It became like a drug, so I just had to leave it. And there are people out there who are dependent upon Facebook for praise, for worship, for feeling emotions, to feel good, to feel accepted. You go and you tie your shoelace and you take a picture. I'm tying my shoelace. And you post it. So everyone will give thumbs up. Oh, that's the best way to tie your shoelace. But this is what the world has become. And some things that are good like this can be used for the wrong. It can become a drug. Is this one a drug? Which part of the brain does it affect? Some people don't agree with me. Let me ask you this. When you go and watch Spider-Man Part 2, what do you want after you come out? Spider-Man Part 3. When you finish Spider-Man Part 3, what do you want? You want Spider-Man, Spider-Man Miles Morales or whatever they're going to create next. Homecoming or... And is it easy to let go of it? When you go, or let me ask something that's more closer to home. Huh? When you go and watch Black Panther what, Part 1, what do you want next? Black Panther Part 2. And is it easy to let go of it? Movies actually are drugs. And what part of the brain do they affect? And where does God want to communicate with? Even the cartoons, my brothers and sisters, even, they do, even though they put the letter G on it, it, that letter G doesn't mean good. Even the cartoons are enough to short-circuit the frontal lobe of our children and they will not accept the words that you are giving to them or the lessons that you are teaching to them. The movies will teach them. And the movies will impress upon them the things that God may not want. So we have to be careful. These things are very dangerous drugs. Is pornography a drug? When you watch a bit, will you want to see more? Naked people running around. Yes. It's not like, I'll just see one, I'll satisfy my curiosity. You'll want to see more. It will addict you. Many men today are struggling. I did a survey with one of the doctors working under me in the high schools. And we found that almost 50% of the boys in high schools, grade 9 and 10, 11 and 12, 
they were using pornography or exposed to pornography. That's amazing, huh? A very dangerous drug. And what part of the brain does it affect? Frontal lobe. How can we reach our young people when they are affected by pornography? Gambling. Is it a drug? Yes. Same thing affects the frontal lobe too. Now I'm going to put something that's going to affect a lot of you. But answer me honestly. Is this a drug? For Papua Guineans, we'll say it's rugby league. For Fijians, we say it's rugby union. Ah, sevens. When you watch State of Origin Series 1 and Maroons loses, what do you want? Game 2, game 2, game 2. We'll see if the Blues really have it or not. And when you watch game 2, what do you want? Game 3. And when that is finished, you want the next year again. You watch the whole season, grand final, you want the next year again. World Cup comes around, you want the next World Cup again. Is it a drug? Yes. And which part of the brain does it affect? And where does God communicate to us? Is it a wonder why God sometimes struggles to speak to his children? Are we addicted to drugs? Many times we don't realize, but we are intoxicating ourselves and the voice of God cannot be heard. These things affect our character, our, our personality. They affect our frontal lobes. They cause addiction. If you don't believe me, you can try and leave them for a while and you will see you will struggle to let go of it together, altogether. Even food can become a drug. Even a woman can become a drug. You remember King David. Did King David have any addictions? Sometimes the things about addictions, you will see it in the father and it will go to the son too. I'm giving you a clue. Did he have any addictions? What was he addicted to? King David was addicted to women. He had, I don't know, some the theologians can correct me, I thought about 17 wives or something like that, a number of wives, more than 10. Am I correct? He had a number of wives. And his son, how many wives did Solomon have? 700 wives and how many concubines? 300. So the addictions of the parents usually pass to the children. That's normal. Father is an alcoholic, most likely the child will become an alcoholic. If the father loves food, most likely the child will love what? Food. It's no different. David loved women. And believe it or not, all the addictions I'm talking about, they are actually part of the sin in us, the carnal nature. That is sin in us. It is sin in us. And the only way to overcome this, how can we overcome all these things? How can we overcome these substances? How can we overcome these addictions? How can we let go of all of them? David gives the answer himself because he went through it. He says in Psalm 119 verse 9, How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. David said the only way for you and I to be clean is by obeying the law of God. By obeying the law of God. By His Spirit coming in and transforming our lives. Because believe it or not, all the things that I have talked about, the love for rugby, the love for gambling, the love for pornography, the love for all these things, alcohol, all these things are a manifestation of sin in our lives. And the only way to overcome sin is through the power of the Holy Spirit. By being changed in our hearts and minds. That's what Paul says, we all need our hearts and minds to be transformed. Did David overcome his addiction to women? Did David overcome his addiction to women? His addiction led him to killing Uriah. It led him to committing murder. Did he overcome it? When David was old, if you read the Bible, when David was old, 
His body was so old and frail that he could not keep his own heat. So they had to put young women beside him in the bed, naked women. They put them inside, beside him on the bed, and they slept with him and hugged him to keep him warm. Did David ever touch those women? It's written in the Bible for our understanding that David never once touched any of those young ladies. Why? Because God changed him totally. That power of sin inside him was removed completely. His addiction to women was gone altogether. My brothers and sisters, whatever addictions you and I have, God is able to take it away from us. But we have to make the decision to let go. We have to make the decision to turn off our TVs. We have to make, make our decision to delete the movie files on our hard drives. We have to make the decision to not go into the store, into that particular section where the thing is that we love so much. We have to make the decision to run away from Potiphar's wife, if you understand what I'm saying. Don't stand and try and reason. Run away. We have to make the decision to do what is right. And the Lord will bless us and help us. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word. May God bless you all and hopefully we can see you again tomorrow night. Thank you.